Special thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Hello guys, Winston here. Remember that SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule I machined a few weeks ago? Of course you do, because having a sponsor is forcing me to actually release videos in rapid succession and it definitely hasn't been long enough for you to forget about that one. Well, as it turns out, I was quite captivated by that project, and in the process of making a bunch to give away to friends and a few to sell, I went down a pretty deep rabbit hole trying to optimize my production process. So today, I want to go over all the nitty gritty details about my Fusion setup and what I learned about doing a mini production run on my Pocket NC. Let's recap where I left off last time. I started this project with a Crew Dragon STL model from Thingiverse courtesy of user Zastro. My Pocket NC setup began by facing the front of my stock. Since I was eyeballing my stock placement, this would ensure a consistent, predictable amount of material would be left before I started the roughing toolpaths. The first of these was an adaptive toolpath coming in from the top of my stock, the positive Y direction. This would be the most efficient orientation to machine from because the tool would continuously spiral in from the outside of the material with very little need for repositioning moves. Next, I used an adaptive roughing toolpath from the four cardinal directions about the B axis. 3D contour operations were used to clean up the flat protruding faces of the fins. I used a slope constraint to keep the toolpath touching only the vertical faces of the fins, and I used a bottom height constraint so that the toolpath would ignore anything past the fins. I wanted to remove as much of that stock to leave as possible so that a rotary toolpath wouldn't bump into the fins while smoothing out the stair step texture left by the adaptive toolpaths. The final toolpath done by my quarter inch single flute was a rotary toolpath wrapping around the B axis to reduce that stump supporting my workpiece to a known radius so I wouldn't accidentally crash into it later. Next up was a 16th inch ball end mill doing a pair of rotary finishing toolpaths, sandwiching another set of 3D contour passes on the fins. That 3D contour was there because I was still noticing incidental sidewall contact by the ball end mill that marred the surface finish on those fins. And then lastly, I finished things off with an 8th inch end mill that left a single wobbly tab underneath my part. The theoretical runtime for all of this was 3 hours and 35 minutes. The realistic runtime was somewhere north of 4 hours. And that was absolutely not sustainable to continue. So how do we improve things? Well, the first thing I could do to speed up my process had nothing to do with toolpath optimization, at least not directly. It has to do with total material removal. If I increase the size of the dragon capsule, that reduces the material margin around it. The height of my capsule would increase, which would cause the consumed stock volume to grow linearly, but as the radius grows, the cross-sectional area of my stock to machine away decreases as a function of the radius squared. If you let Wolfram Alpha do the math, the takeaway is that with 1 inch diameter round stock, as long as the trunk of my dragon capsule is greater than 0.6 inches, I'm coming out ahead by making it larger. Bigger dragon equals less material to remove. Next up to be improved were my adaptive roughing toolpaths. In addition to increasing step over or optimal load by 20%, I also experimented with feed rate override. And over the course of several dragons, I ended up at a linear feed rate that was 25% faster than my original recipe. The toolpath at this point was just starting to sound a little questionable, but those subtle vibrations that you hear never devolved into pure chatter, so I was okay letting the machine run like this. That made all of the adaptive toolpaths faster, but I could still do better. The worst part of these toolpaths were the little arc moves that cleared out the material underneath the fins. I decided I was better off employing some plain 2D contour toolpaths targeting sketch geometry to slot away the material under the fins. This would save the adaptive toolpaths from having to go down there. Also, I no longer needed four adaptive toolpaths around the B axis. So four toolpaths became two, and 97 minutes of roughing became 50. And then, for my fin cleanup, I started using negative stock to leave with my quarter inch end mill. This would cause the fins to be undersized, reducing the possibility that they would be marred by accidental contact later with smaller end mills producing less desirable surface finishes. On the toolpath known as the Big Rotary Approach, I reduced the angular resolution of the toolpath to make it go faster. About 7 minutes was saved here. Switching to the 1 16th inch end mill, I started with what I call the approach pass, a finishing toolpath with a tiny amount of stock to leave so cutting forces on the final finishing toolpath would be more consistent. Prior to that final finishing toolpath, I tried something new. I ran a 1 degree sliver of that rotary toolpath to start things off. Because the first pass of that finishing toolpath, just like in a pocketing toolpath, is a full width of cut operation. And then, once the toolpath gets going and establishes the first groove, it'll only ever hit material on one side of the tool. That difference in cutting forces can absolutely affect surface finishes, especially on a desktop CNC, and doubly so with a small end mill. 
So that first line of this rotary toolpath is always the worst and likely to leave a visible and tactile seam where the toolpath begins and ends. That intermediate toolpath allows the final rotary finishing pass to have a nice easy start and that really helped the consistency of my dragon capsules. I also increased the sensitivity of feed optimization so my CNC would slow down well before running into high engagement corners. If you can hear a tool chirping, you'll likely be able to see a corresponding surface finish artifact. This change dramatically reduced instances of that. For my operations to tab off the capsule, my new method was to use strictly 2D contours. Previously, I did a 2D contour on one side while the part was still rigidly attached, and then used a constrained adaptive to nibble away at the rest, thinking that would reduce the chances of vibration and the end mill taking a bite out of the bottom of my capsule. This new method uses a 2D contour toolpath with a finishing pass to within 3-4mm of the center line of the part. That leaves a smoother finish towards the outside of my capsule's bottom and also reduces the wall contact and friction on the end mill. That wider channel allows the cutter to only touch one wall at a time. Then I switch to a single pass contour with some stock to leave. The idea here being that any small vibrations would still remain proud of the final part geometry and I could sand things flat later. This toolpath was patterned 180 degrees around my part and would take about 10 minutes to run. And I would only have to pay attention to the final minute or two of this toolpath. The cumulative effects of these changes was a net reduction in theoretical machining time by about an hour and vastly improved part consistency. On the days where I was working from home or on the weekends, I could knock out two dragon capsules a day easily. I just had to stop into the garage about once every hour and a half to change tools or load material. And with the shape of my capsules and the shape of the remaining stock left behind, I could very efficiently slide my stock forward and get three capsules for every 6 inch bar of aluminum. And most impressively in my opinion was the fact that I did every capsule you see here with a single set of end mills. None of them broke or clogged, and even after many dozens of hours of machining, they were still producing perfectly acceptable surface finishes. But I still wasn't finished with this project yet. I wanted to spruce up the bottoms of these capsules. Based on the diameter of the trunk, which was ever so slightly different on the solar panel side of the model, I created a pair of soft jaws that would capture my machined capsules. There was a cutout to accommodate the umbilical ports and trunk connections, but that would also give me a useful alignment cue for these soft jaws. I designed one half of this fixture to be bolted to my threaded table on a 1.5 inch hole spacing. I intended for the other half to be secured with a trigger clamp. Not the most high tech solution, but this was supposed to be a quick and dirty means to an end. The soft jaws were printed on Elmer, my Ender 5 Pro, out of PLA, and PLA was not ideal for reasons you'll soon see. I had several ideas for how I wanted to machine the trunks. The most ambitious idea was to actually hollow out the bottoms. I designed an adaptive toolpath to try and do this with parameters I thought were mathematically sound in terms of chip load, however I failed to consider heat. Aluminum cuts, even with optimal settings, do generate some heat, and as you machine away material, you have less thermal mass to dissipate that heat into. Hollow plastic structures are also quite good insulators of heat, and the soft jaws basically surrounded my capsule on all sides. There was virtually no way to conduct heat out of my part, and almost no convective cooling happening here either. As I machined away at the trunk, you can see the point at which my PLA soft jaws began to soften and deform. And you can also see the moment that I realized that aluminum that's hot enough to melt plastic is also hot enough to burn human flesh. A higher temperature plastic might have survived longer, but it would only delay the inevitable. This plastic soft jaw concept was a thermal disaster. But luckily I noticed this issue before my Shapeoko ripped the capsule out of my fixture and threw it into low earth orbit. Sorry folks, you're just going to have to wait a little longer for me to build up enough footage to release a CNC bloopers reel. I printed a new set of soft jaws and settled on simply facing off the bottom of my capsules and engraving my logo on them. And in case you're wondering, I found the center of my capsules by scribing lines across opposing fins and then lining up the tip of my engraver to the intersection. I only had to do this twice. Once for the first iteration of my dragons and once for the larger, more efficiently machined dragons. Within each version of the dragon capsules, the dimensional accuracy from the pocket NC parts was excellent. I used a 501 PCB engraver for my logo, as I often find myself doing, and I did a couple passes that were just 2 to 3 thou deep. And then to finish the bottom, since the raw machined finish off the Shaboko isn't anything to write home about, I sanded up to 800 grit to achieve a nice satin look. That would hide scratches better, since these would probably sit on desks and be picked up and handled frequently. On the 800 grit pass, I put my sandpaper on top of some paper towels to allow it some give. This subtly rounds over the edges, making them smooth and pleasant to hold. 
Only when I'd completed enough baby crew dragons to send to friends that had been promised capsules and a few to sell did I revisit my first sacrificial dragon that had melted my soft jaws earlier. In order to finish machining that pocket and hide the misalignment that had occurred as it melted its way into the fixture, I machined a larger circular pocket than originally intended. This would leave me thinner walls than planned, but it would at least even out the thickness of them. And after I had finished looking at this piece, I was quite glad I didn't go this route. That large bore in the trunk can't be finished like the sanded bottoms of the other dragons, and it also makes the capsule quite top-heavy, which is not good for something you want to sit stably on your desk. However, I did have another idea I wanted to try for myself, which was to embed a magnet in the trunk. I had some half-inch diameter disc magnets I figured would do the trick, so I created a shallow pocket toolpath with many variations of stock to leave. This would let me creep up on the perfect fit one thou at a time. I bored out progressively larger holes in my capsule by adding negative stock to leave to my toolpaths until I felt I could almost fit in the magnet. I could have easily gone oversized on this pocket and used CA glue or epoxy to secure my magnet, but I felt that an interference fit would be just as permanent and require no cleanup. A tight bore like this would have resulted in a lot of squeeze out if I'd used an adhesive method to secure the magnet. With the nose of my dragons cushioned and seated in a hole on my CNC table, a couple taps with a mallet was just enough to permanently lock in the magnets. This is not a variation I plan on selling because it requires a lot of trial and error and repeated assessment and finagling to make it work, but it is one I find extremely satisfying. Almost as satisfying as the process of revamping my website thanks to Squarespace. Squarespace is a leading online platform for building and hosting beautiful websites quickly and easily. They provide powerful tools for designing eye-catching websites, peace of mind through well-managed data centers, and real humans to answer any questions you might have about running a website. All you have to do is bring an idea. So join a growing community of makers and creatives using Squarespace to express their visions by going to squarespace.com and starting a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Winston Moy to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I want to thank you all very much for watching. If you're interested in purchasing a Crew Dragon, they're not quite ready to launch yet, pun totally intended. I need to work out a classier way of packaging these. But when I have that figured out, I'll put a very limited number of capsules on my website, probably with an accompanying video and announcement on social media. I'll be back soon with more CNC projects and DIY nonsense.